Hello, Hollows and Halloweens. My name is Devious Guy, and welcome back to the boss designs of Dark Souls 2. If you remember last time, we killed the last giant, who ironically was the first boss <laughs> of the game, at least the first one that we ran into. We managed to make our way back to the bonfire here, do a little bit of stuff, and end the episode. So I think the first thing I'm going to do, now that we've beaten a boss, is stop looking like that. Okay, I thought... Huh. Why can I not do that? Well, okay, it turns out I don't actually know how to not be hollow anymore. That sucks. Okay. But there's a couple of things we can follow up on from last time. For example, we gave the blacksmith his shop you back. Stand back. This is dangerous work. Okay, he doesn't have a lot to say. Let's see. Well, I mean, this is my broken straight sword, which I could make him fix, but I don't see much of a point. Aw, no Svaihinda. But, let's see... I'm kind of tempted towards a mace. That's one weapon I never used in Dark Souls 1 was, was blunt weapons. Sure, why not? Let's try it. Let's try something new, at least. And then, once it doesn't work and I die 15 times, we can go back to the old one. Wait, can I steal from him? Yay! Thievery! Do I have a better helmet? Please tell me I have something that just looks a little nicer. Yeah, there we go. There. Once I get my mustache back, I can show it off. Okay. The m must be a way to... Oh. You... Oh, you just... You, you, you just... You, you just use it. Okay. I'll probably be playing a little bit more Fashion Souls in this one, but we'll see. Of the curse. Seek souls, seek the king, lest this lands. I'll put some into strength and then... Let's actually get some health going on in here, come to think of it, because... I'm a little fragile, I think. Final little visit. Oh, you again. Uh, she's got throwing stuff and so... Uh, uh, the branch of yore. I have to imagine that that fragrant branch of yore is how you unpetrify the dude in the starting area. So that you can go in and kill those disgusting, horrifying basilisk creatures. So, the first thing I think we're going to do is we're going to go back to the Forest of the Giants a little bit and explore a bit more. Also, just test out the new weapon. <laughs> I can't help but think that there's something going on down here and I just, I just did the wrong thing about it. Oh, calm down. Ow, ow, ow. Okay, the range on this mace is not great. Oh, there's a ladder. <laughs> it's literally just a ladder right there. I'd give my life, not for honor, but for you, Snake Eater. The gag will... No, hello. The gag will never die, my friends. It will... Oh, I do a lot of damage to him now. I like this. Ah! Oh, f you! You, I thought I could backstab you or something. Son of a bitch. God damn it. <laughs> oh, that was pretty funny though. Uh, this feels like pain, right? I'd take damage from walking on it. No? Ah! Oh! Uh, I don't know what that is, but I don't like... Okay... The... A fire longsword! Okay, you hold it then. I see. Aha! Aha! Ah! It's okay. He has a longer range than I thought. 
Is the door going to block my shots? No! Okay. You couldn't do that before. All right, then. At least I get my souls back. Hooray! Can I hit him from here is the question. Yay! <laughs> This might take a while. Can I jump in there? No? Well, what's the point of doing all that then? It's a little annoying that I have to go back to the Emerald Herald just to level up each time. But it does make you dependent on her. Like, it does make her a central character to your playthrough, whether you like it or not. Yeah. So, like, hopefully the Herald is actually very central to the to the story and the game as it is. You know, to kind of justify how important she is. I've heard a lot in the comments about power stancing, which is unique to Dark Souls 2, and which has something to do with dual wielding when you have a certain amount of stats above what the weapon needs. What does this one need? No, ugh. I'm so bad at reading the main. It needs 12. So 50% over that would be 18. So technically, if I bought a second mace, I could power stance it? <gasps> Let's try it for a while. This seems fun. <laughs> Bam. Come here. Ah! Of course, I can't block at all now. Like, at all. <laughs> so... Okay. Right. Good. I'm so paranoid about jumping in Dark Souls games. Right, I see. Is that a one-time thing, or are we doing Sen's Fortress in here? If another stone comes rolling, now I'm dead. Okay. Th there was no floor there. And... Boulder. Is the boulder just a one-time thing? Don't do a boulder. Don't do a boulder. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just... My name is Kale. I'm navigating the continent to create a map. Yeah, what? sorry. I'll well, get back to you in a second. Okay, Captain Cartographer over here. I came to this land some time ago. Drangling the Lost Kingdom. It sounded so romantic. Have you seen Majula? Oh, there's a rather spacious mansion there. I've made it my temporary home. Well, as something of a squatter, I'm afraid. Inside the mansion, I found a strange map, like none I'd ever seen. I believe that it's a map of Drenna. Now I'm traveling the land to prove it. Yes, yes, that's it. That's why I came to the kingdom. Did he forget? No. That wasn't it. He did I forget. Know. I don't seem to recall. Okay. Were you looking for that map? No. Wonderful. Then you're fascinated by maps, just like me. No. You? you should have told me before. I haven't said anything. A key to the mansion. Okay. What a joy to meet a kindred spirit out here. Right. Incredible, really, isn't it? Such a map to be chiseled in stone. Oh, but one thing. I would not venture deep into the mansion. Ah. I can't be certain, but I've heard disturbing noises. Something about it feels wrong. Just be careful, please. I'll be back in Majula soon. Perhaps we will meet again and discuss maps at our leisure. This man is a nerd, and might also have thrown a boulder at me. 
Okay. Um. Oh, the soldier key opens that type of door. I felt like I remembered it because it opened the same kind of door over here. And I thought that was just going to be like the way forward. Like full stop. No, no, it's actually okay. So that's one path out of many. Ring of Restoration and Torch. Oh, gradually restores HP. It also weighs a pound? How does a ring weigh a full pound? And what's in here? Oh, okay, stairs. I thought it was just nothing. Oh, I see. So that's why there's a torch out here, so you can bring some fire with you. Okay, then. I really like this. I really like this torch mechanic. I think it's cool. Like, it, it gives you much more of a sense of exploration, I think. Oh, no, skeletons. Oh, no. <laughs> Please tell me they don't revive. Okay, these ones don't. Skellingtons, then. Oh, is that a big skellington? Or just a normal size? Whoa, it's multiple skellingtons. Okay. Okay. What's gonna kill me in here? Oh, come on. Ah, uh, there we go. Ambush. Of course there was. Hmm. Hmm. Ah! What the hell? Where did you come from? Oh, this is not great. I need to get them in a place where I can fire. <laughs> Why are there three of them? Oh, they're all still following me. <laughs> Okay, he's backing off, but he's not. Okay, I can aggro one of them. Ugh. So I guess they were up there the whole time? Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> Hoorah for message. Oi! <laughs> Whoo! I survived! <laughs> I'm alive! I uh, guess I have to. That's the last Estus. A whip. Okay, that sounds cool. <laughs> ba 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 ba! Ba ba ba! Okay. Now what? Oh, can you dual wield great swords with power stance? That feels like it's probably possible. <laughs> How much strength do you know? Oh, no! Oh, come on, why? Oh, it's not a player. Wait, it is a player. Oh, f*** me! At least he behaves a bit like one. And also not quite. I don't have any Estus whatsoever. Ah! I couldn't dodge. I was in the middle of the animation. So now I have to deal with all the skeletons again. Okay. Oh man, the Ninja Turtles are gonna be back too. I... <laughs> he hit a blast barrel for some reason. Oh, sh holy f I got lucky. All right. Is Dennis gonna be back? Oh, he's back. Hello. Whoa, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> no! Well, all right. 
Okay. Dennis, it's time for round three. Why are those guys not respawning? Hmm. Is the game taking pity on me? Is it spawning fewer enemies because I suck? <laughs> oh, the skeletons are back at least. They respect me. Thank you, skeleton friends, for respecting my abilities. Oh, f*** mm. off! Oh, you son of a bitch mother f*** <laughs> hollow little piece of c Mamma mia! Okay, we'll leave that bit for later now. I think I think it's pretty clear that I'm not prepared either in skill level or just, you know, character level to face that. And my souls are gone anyway. Now, now they're gone. I couldn't reclaim them, so. Hi. Oh, you're so much more manageable than Dennis and the turtles. Produce the symbol of the king. Ring required ahead, therefore hurrah for ring. And now we'll deal with you guys. Oh f oh f oh shit. <laughs> uh, it's always the groups, isn't it? Oh, would you please be stupid enough to hit? <laughs> I will find a way to deal with this. I swear to God. Okay. Anyway, be wary of chest in short trap ahead. Okay. Oh, so that's where Pharaoh's lock lockstone is gonna do. Okay. Okay, so I guess... When I open the chest, the door opens, and a whole bunch of people come out. Well, fuck it, let's just die. Oh, oh, oh! It's no, it's just, it's just a trap. <laughs> no, it was just a trap. Well, I got the Titanite shard out of the chest before I died. <laughs> That's something. So is the door down there open now, or is it a thing where the trap rearms? Oh no, the door's open. Okay. Carefully. 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 Careful, L-Y. Life ring and titanite shards. Back to the bonfire. I need to spend these souls on something. Yes. I understand the bear seek seek lest meme now, by the way. There we go. Oh my god, I have health again. That's a big book. Oh, hey, a Ferris's lockstone. Skeleton, huh? Oh, yeah, hey. Do you want to take a swing at me? Yes, you do. Oh! Oh, no! Oh, he can parry! And he's a lot tougher than the other skeletons. Soul Vessel? What is Soul Vessel? Show this to a certain person and... A vessel that will accept your souls. It can allow real allocation of levels, but without proper assistance, it may simply drain you of souls. If you truly wish to start again, go to the place where your journey began. So that you can respec? I guess? Well, neat. That's something. So this will be the map the guy was talking about, right? Or is it? I don't know. It's hard to tell what the hell this is. I can't really see what this is supposed to represent, if anything. Guess we'll have to come back to it. Okay, well, slow progress 
if any. Uh, well, some progress. I've leveled up a little bit, I guess. So the only thing to do is either go back to the Forest of Giants and try to get past Dennis, I guess? Or look for another way forward? Or else try some of the path paths here. Oh, no, wait, there's actually this one thing I can do. Still, do you wish to stop? Oh, okay, so that is, no, right. of course not. Right, cool, okay, so if I want to, I can go into sorcery or something later. And make a different build. That's nice, that's cool. But there is one thing which I wasn't willing to do before, because <laughs> I had literally no equipment. Oh. Oh, it's another one of those. Oh, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea! Ugh, got him. Jerk. Stone ring. Interesting. Additional reduction of enemy poise. And it weighs a pound and a half? How? The beloved ring of the gallant shieldless Lothian, formerly of Forosa, hits greatly reduce enemy poise. The effect may seem trivial, but for those who comprehend how critical it is to exploit a hole in enemy defenses, the significance of this ring will be clear. There isn't like a passage or anything? No? Just a big monster. Okay. See, because the only other two things I know is this passage here, which I haven't explored yet. Well, I can't target him, so... Have you business with me? That's a cool sword. The way you're under is all blocked up, you see. By this god off his statue. Can I have your sword? Above. Who thought it a good idea to pit it there? Oof. I'm in quite the pickle now. Is is that guy the sick mire of this game? See that statue? Gives me the willies. You stare at it for long enough, it starts to look alive. Ach, it just doesn't he seem quite right. There are no craftsmen around these parts. Hey, you don't think a real life person was turned to stone, do you? Oh, jeez, what the hell is that? Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. So is there another guy in here? Oh, yep. I backstab you really quietly. Yes! <laughs> what does he mean, statue? And oh, okay. So I guess I need to get an unpetrified branch to get this lady out of her predicament there. Okay. Back to Majula. I really don't want to have to deal with Dennis. But surely there's something else in the forest of giants I've missed. Oh, son of a... Right, those guys are here. Stop it! Oh, you bastards. There's this door. Because I can't open the one in the corridor to the giant. But there's this door. Whoa! I didn't even see him. I want that sword. Ah, phew. Thought that would kill him. Hello. Hey, Fogdor. That's the first one we've seen in a while. Yeah, should not have spent all my stamina. Okay, you. Was there a boss that close by the whole time? Oh, that would be hilarious. Oh no. Oh no, really? Oh no, not you. Wait, is that the same guy? I mean, he seems to have a really big sword, so I... Feel oh no, that's definitely the Why can you fly? And if you can fly, why do you have that bird? Oh sh 
No boss HP bar, though. Oh, there it is. Okay, the Pursuer, huh? Whoa! Okay. Interesting armor set he's got there. You can see the faces of people in, in it, almost as though they're trophies of the people he's killed. Well, his move set is relatively simple. I suspect that'll change at some point. Okay. Oh, that seems like a stab. Yeah, that's the curse stab thing he's got. Right. Oi! Stop that. Annoying. Please let me heal. He did not let me heal. Oh boy. You just can't roll through things, can you? Heal. Okay. Right. So there definitely yeah, he's got windows. Okay. Very low key boss fight this one, I think. I should really roll to the side when he does that instead of rolling backwards. Cuz then I can do that. Ow. Big mistake. Ah! Did it again! No, okay, I'm dead. I'm probably dead. He's got me in a corner! Let me heal, let me heal! Ugh! So... He seems to gather trophies from his enemies by the look of it. Like, I think those weapons he's carrying are trophies from defeated foes. I think that's the implication here. I should really roll to the side. It makes it easier to get in on him. Okay. Not doing terribly for a first attempt. I'm dead. <sighs> well, he got me. I want to rotate the camera. I want to see. Okay. Well, we found him. Well, a guy. The pursuer, huh? Bunch of anime bullshit. That's what he is. Let's just get back up there. Oh, now he just comes out of the ground. Hey, sucker! Come on, third hit, no? Okay. Oh, there's the third hit! Dick! I just felt like life gems are so slow when you consume them. And they also heal really slowly. Ah! That range, though! Okay, let's get you to do a hit. So I can... Maybe... Yeah! I want to be able to roll through his attacks, but why can't I? Well, it definitely forces you to be more careful. Oh, sh I staggered him. I didn't even realize. Okay. Right. Second try, maybe? But yeah, there's a lot of detail going on with this guy's character design in the sense that, ah, you get the sense that this is someone who only cares about fighting and combat. Like, that's really all there is to him is. Which is also par part and parcel of the design of the big sword. Ugh. Whew. 
Ugh. Yeah, so between the very large sword and the general design aesthetic of having him carry all those weapons around and having those, like, the soles of pained, tortured faces on his armor and the fact that he's called the Pursuer feels a lot like what he is, is someone who basically hunts down worthy opponents and kills them, like one of your classic anime archetypes. A guy who just lives to fight, who lives for combat, and whose main purpose in life is just to fight worthy foes and collect trophies from them. Because he never uses any of the other weapons. He never shows any inclination, even, towards picking them up. He just, he just attacks you with his big-ass sword, which gives me the impression that those weapons are more for show, as it were. Let's see. Soul of the Pursuer who lurks in Drang Lake. The Pursuer, who seeks the bearer of the sign, will not rest until his target is slain. Aha! Well, that's interesting, because that seems to indicate that the guy was only after me. Oh, hello. Oh! Oh! Oh, well, that's familiar. Well, transport by Big Bird. I guess the Pursuer's bird friend helped me out now? Oh, oh, thank God. A little tempted to go back and see if I missed anything. Like, because if you drop down here, you just go back down to where you came in, right? But there's a thing there. Oh, sh That's a full armor set. Oh, I've also activated that guy. Everyone is angry now. <laughs> okay, I think I have a solution for that particular problem. Okay. Back to Majula. And spend some souls. Yeah. Yeah, alright. Sweet, okay. Well, that was the Pursuer, a, a boss that should not have taken me even remotely uh, that long to find, but there we go. <laughs> so I'm going to send it over to Future Sky to maybe take a closer look at that guy's character design and some of the specifics of that armor, because there seemed to be quite a bit of stuff going on, especially with the breastplate. So, over to you, Future Sky. Yeah, hi, Future Sky in here. Uh, change your plans, actually. We're gonna do two bosses in this episode. You'll see why later. Right, so the obvious thing to do now, then, would be to be start exploring the Lost Bastille. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Dull Ember. Key item of some sort. Oh! Uh, you're large. Are you not hostile? Try left. I think not. Oop, oop, oop. Wait. Careful. Extremely careful. Radiant life gem and light large titanite shard. Cool. Okay. And back... I guess. <laughs> Praise the sun. Okay, it feels like I should be able to push this thing somehow. But... I don't have a kick. Can I punch it? No. How would I do that? Oh, shit! <laughs> okay! That looks funny. I just fell down. 
Oh my god. <laughs> the only thing that would have made that funnier is if I died doing it. Oh. <laughs> oh, hello, you are not hostile? What is it? I don't know you, and you don't know me. Is that a large are dad mask? <laughs> you are an odd one. Normally, people keep a safe distance when they see this mask. But you... I'm called Lucatil. From the land of Mira to the far east, across the mountains. They say Drang Lake brims with powerful souls. And so I came to claim my share. But what a strange place. Even the rumors did not prepare me. You are an odd one indeed. I've always made a point of avoiding people. While you've made a point of engaging me. I can see that you are mid-journey. If you require assistance, I will help you. I come from Mira, a land of knights. My sword is always ready. You're cool. Don't hesitate to call upon me. Whatever happens, I won't be missed. You are an odd one. I can see that I come, don't hesitate. Okay, so I guess if I turn human, I can use her as a summon in a boss fight or something. Antiquated key. Oh, that reminds me, I picked up an ember thing. Oh, it is just, oh, it's just a blacksmith's ember. Cool. In the past, Majula served as a dumping ground for horrible things, but is now a gathering place for those with no play, better place to go. Interesting. I feel like I wasn't done exploring back here. Some people clearly died here. But what's gonna get me? Oh, you have got to be sh <laughs> me! I dealt with you, though! Why are you here again? I guess we're not done with you. Well, it makes sense. Like, his whole description was that he will never stop until he kills me. Or anyone wearing the mark, I suppose. Well, the one wearing the mark, it says. You're only getting one video, dude. Goddamn fanboys just trying to get into my super popular Dark Souls gameplay series. What's he doing? No! Oh, what's that? Oh, what is that? All right. So is this going to be like on the rooftop where he doesn't respawn again? Or is he absolutely going to respawn? He's absolutely going to respawn. Okay. So, priority one, get whatever the hell is in there. Cool. Priority two, souls. Priority three, leave. And that makes him go away too. Okay, so the Pursuer is going to be a recurring enemy, I see. Once as a boss fight, and then... Later just as an asshole. Bravely bold Sir Robin rode forth from Camelot. He was not afraid to die, oh brave Sir Robin. He was not at all afraid to be killed in nasty ways. Brave, 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 brave Sir Robin. He was not the least bit scared to be thrown into a ditch. Okay, so I have a fragrant branch of yore now. I guess I got that from the thing. I could unpetrify that guy and go in there. Or I could use the branch to unpetrify the lady who's petrified back at Majula. Or the guy who's petrified in the betwixt area. I don't know what to do. Do there. I mean, I guess I can just buy more branches later, but gold pine resin. Below, in short, be wary of door. Oh, why is there a 
door that leads out into nothing. I guess it's a thing to make people fall to their doom. It's locked, okay. And I can't do anything about that from this direction. I guess we can't progress here anymore? Unless we use the herb to unpetrify that guy. Back to Majula for now. I see that you have, I hear that embers, but the whole art was lost. Including myself. Hmm. Okay, he can't use embers for anything. A little bit at a loss. Kind of want to explore a little bit. I never went up the cliff. I don't know if that leads to a new area. Oh, no, it doesn't. Enter Covenant. No, I'm in one already. I'm sorry. I'm in a committed relationship. Oh, five homeward bones. Nice. That's good. Contraption does not move. Indeed. This is well maintained. Down, 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 down. Oh, treasure chest. Okay, so that's a whole different area, basically. What is this, the sewer level? That looks about right. Well, something down here is killing people. But yeah, so far in Dark Souls 2, much less of a sense of direct progression. That's a lot of pools of blood. Tough enemy ahead. Much less of a sense of direct progression than I had in... Uh... I? What's your deal? I can't talk to them. Oh! Oh, mm. Oh, that's a big guy. Oh, that's... Oh, that's a lot of very big guys. Is this an Orlando for Dark Souls 2, then? Ah. Sh that was dumb. Oh, okay. They take a lot of damage. <laughs> I guess maces work on them. Do you have a third? Yeah, you do. Uh. But that looks interesting, though. I'm interested now. Because it seemed like I could beat them. Like, I don't think I was under-leveled for the area. I was just being stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Nice. Okay. I can beat you. Am I supposed to be able to? No, I don't think I'm supposed to jump over there. That would be bad. Oh, there's a bonfire right down there. Nice. Okay, that's that's good, because if I had to walk all the way back here every time I died to the big guys, that would suck. There we go. That's less stupid. Again, though, like, <clears throat> looking at the contrast with what Dark Souls 1 did... Look at all the water here, and how alive it is. Where in contrast, like, in Dark Souls 1, as I remember, like, every time we found water, it was practically just still. Like, it wasn't moving at all. But here you get much more of a sense that there is an alive world around you, where in Dark Souls 1, the whole world is still all the time. Basically, almost dead. Constantly. There really isn't a lot of motion or movement in the environment, and it's a very different thing in Dark Souls 2, like, the world feels much more alive around you. Which gives a very different mood to the whole thing. Like, not that it's all optimistic and happy all of a sudden, but it's a, it's a, it's a different feeling. There we go. Lloyd's Talisman. Which I hope I'll never need to use. Whoa! What's that? I guess we'll find out. Oh, 
Oh. That did a thing. Oh, more big guys. <laughs> Cheap, but it works. I don't mind being cheap. Oh, they did not like that at all. So there was three of them in here. If I had done this the fair way, I would have had to fight three of them. Oh, God. And last hit. Oh, would you just... Please. I need more stamina. Good lord. Wait, is that a boss fight in there? So I'm... Oh, so by raising the floor... I make sure that I can't get thrown in the water by the boss or something like that. Is that what's happening? One of those guys is gonna turn out to be hostile all of a sudden. Okay. Okay, so I need to attack that guy to get the treasure chest, and if I attack one of them, all of them become hostile. That's what it looks like. Worth a shot! Let's see. Oh! Dragon Rider, huh? Okay, dude in armor. I see what you mean, but I see what you mean when you say Dark Souls has a reputation for dude in armor bosses. Okay. Oh. Okay. So what kinds of moves do you have? Dragon Rider though, so one would imagine. Oh boy. That that means he's able to summon a dragon. <clears throat> okay. Not the most creative move set in the world. Ow. You really can't dodge very quickly in this game at all. I wish you were more able to cancel out of moves. Okay, so he has a somewhat different aesthetic going on than our dear Pursuer. First of all, because of the lighting in the room. Ah! Okay, I see how you could get thrown out into the water by this guy. But also just because of the way that the room is configured and the way that he is designed with the, like, horns on his helmet that kind of ties in quite nicely to the way that he behaves in terms of as a fighter. Like, with all his stabbing and swinging. But yeah, I can see what people mean when they say that there's not that much interesting stuff to talk about with some Dark Souls bosses, because this guy doesn't really have... He seems to be more of a gatekeeper than a real... challenge as such. Ugh. Oh, boy. Bad. Very bad. Oh, boy. Don't like that. Don't like that. Okay. All right. The curious thing is that he's a dragon rider, but not a lot about him says equestrian of any kind. Like... Not that he needs to be wearing riding boots or anything, but it would be interesting to see him have some kind of a harness or something more than what he has got going on. I do like the shape language of him, though, in that he's this... Like, where you think of the Pursuer, for example. Ah! Cocky. I thought maybe I could kill him in one hit. Okay, I'm gonna use an extra stone. There we go. Let me just get a look. Uh, couldn't get a proper look at him. Curious. Yeah, that's a little bit of a... 
Long ago, the dragon riders mounted worms and were feared on the battlefield for their unparalleled strength. Use a dragon rider soul to acquire blah blah blah, who faithfully served King Vendrick. In here, like with all the red light, I really couldn't see much about him. I really couldn't see what kind of texture his armor had or what was supposed to be going on there. And it kind of sucked a little bit, because I really wanted to get a better look at him. Uh, you okay there, buddy? Oh! No, he's not okay. Well, they finally got hostile, I guess. Ugh. Well, that guy was weird. So the Dragon Rider was not especially interesting on his own. But he is a pretty good expression of the mood of the general area. Because like I said, when we entered the entered the area, this is like this feels a lot like a an Orlando type area in the sense that we are dealing with grand castles and great architecture and sort of the Did I just see wrong, or did someone manage to leave a message at the bottom of the ocean? Um, we're dealing with grand architecture and the effigies of man, which in Dark Souls 1 was very much associated with characters like Ornstein and Smau and the knights um, that were protecting... Oh, they're all hostile now, okay. And the knights that were protecting... Um, what's her face? Guinevere. Like, the big giant knights, which is also what we see here, like, the, the giant knight characters. What the f- Okay, back to a bonfire, right? The higgity heck now. So you have this representation of, like, he's a, he's a dragon rider, but more specifically, he's a knight. And that means he's a knight who's a representative of some kind of um, authority and power. Specifically, in this case, I guess, King Vendrick um, and his reign. Because there's a, like... There's a few interesting angles you could take on him, specifically seeing him as a representation of, like, just basically an, an elite character of the area that he's in. Or as representative of the power of King Vendrick, as it were. But none of it feels very substantial. In terms of, like, substantial enough to have emotional resonance for the fullness of the game. Except... Like, Vendrick is clearly important to this game, and he's important to Dark Souls 2 and to the thematic of the, of the skill, since he's the guy we're trying to get to. So once we know exactly what Vendrick is and how Vendrick plays into the narrative of the game, maybe the Dragon Rider becomes more important in hindsight, but for the moment, I'm just going to send it over to Future Skyen, maybe, to either talk about the Dragon Rider and the Pursuer, or just the Dragon Rider full stop. We'll see. Well, thank you very much, Pascal. And yes, indeed, it turns out to be a double feature this time around. For Dark Souls 1, I followed a format of recording until I beat a boss and then turning that recording session into one video. And that worked very well for that particular video game. For Dark Souls 2, though, because there's so many more bosses in the game, I'm testing out a little messing around with the format to see if it makes sense to do, like, double billings for certain bosses so that a very interesting boss can carry a bit of the load for a boss who might be uh, somewhat less interesting, as indeed is the case today. This is an experimental format change, of course, so if you have any opinions on it, if it makes this video way too long, maybe, or if you don't really want to see two bosses in the same video, please do let me know down in the comments. Anyway, let's talk about the Pursuer and the Dragon Rider. And we'll start with the Dragon Rider, a character who you all heard me struggling somewhat to try and find an interesting angle into analyzing, because when you encounter him, it really just feels like, oh, that's a boss? Okay. Looks a lot like just another one of the big dudes in armor I've been fighting already, but okay, I guess this one's tougher. And a lot of that comes down to the context within which he's presented. Like I said, I've already been fighting a bunch of giants with very large weapons, so another large dude with big weapons doesn't really stand out. Compare that to something like the Capra Demon from Dark Souls 1, a boss that very much does not look like anything else in the environment in which you fight him. But one of the big things that gives me difficulty analyzing the Dragon Rider is something that we're going to be touching on a lot more once we get to the Pursuer, and that's the particular angle and reading from which I am approaching Dark Souls 2. As we talked about in the last episode, the reading of Dark Souls that at least initially makes the most sense to me is to see it as a very 
personal journey, a very personal, perhaps psychological narrative. And within that context, well, the Dragon Rider doesn't really offer me very much to latch onto. The reading that I have established that I want to tackle Dark Souls 2 from doesn't really have a lot of thematic hooks to hang the Dragon Rider on. And you might say, well, Skyen, isn't that just kind of evidence that maybe the reading you've established is flawed and you should abandon it because it can't actually account for the character designs that are in the game? To which I say, shut up. My reading is fine. There's nothing wrong with my reading. There's something wrong with the game. It's the game's fault. Meh. <laughs> Being a bit more serious, it's perfectly possible to have a reading of a piece of media that doesn't take into account every single piece and bit of that piece of media. For example, maybe there's gonna be some bosses in Dark Souls 2 that don't really support my intensely personal psychological reading of the game. That doesn't mean I can't have that reading, but it means I need to recognize that there are certain pieces that don't fit in the jigsaw that I'm attempting to construct. And therefore, it's useful to have more than one framework through which to interpret the media that you enjoy. So, I can't fit the Dragon Rider into my overall reading of Dark Souls 2, but we can still analyze him and approach him just as a piece of character design and as a piece of world building. Which is also sort of what I ended up arriving at when I was desperately casting about for something interesting to say about the guy during the episode. This guy is a representative of the Order of King Vendrick, and as a reflection of the environment in which he exists, he is quite interesting. He's a large dude in armor presiding over an area that's infested with large dudes in armor, and as his soul and later on his equipment makes clear, he's a highly trained elite fighter in the army of King Vendrick. He's a high-ranking officer, basically. And this is very much in evidence on the guy's armor, where I believe we see a bunch of the same sigils that I encountered on that door that requires me to produce the symbol of the king. Now, during my fight with him, he only ever really charged at me and tried to hit me with his halberd, which is a little bit boring as fight designs go, and he never really used his shield to block either, which was weird. But one of the pieces of equipment for which you can exchange his soul is a bow. So this guy is clad in giant-ass heavy armor. He carries a great shield. He uses a giant halberd. And he's an archer. The story that's being told here is of someone who is a profoundly well-rounded warrior. Someone of many skills. And his armor as well is inlaid with golden accents, which are functionally impossible to see in the room in which you fight him because of the red lighting. But once you actually look at the guy's model and concept art, you get a real sense of a culture underlying the design of the equipment that he uses. And this is something that's relevant because Dark Souls 2 has a reputation. A reputation for having a whole bunch of bosses who are just dudes in armor. And definitely one of the things that especially full plate armor does is obliterate personal identity. Like once someone is encased in full plate armor, you can't tell their ethnicity, their age, their gender, anything about the character or the person who's underneath. Character designers like to exploit this for any situation where they need to have a large group of enemies in some kind of a uniform whose humanity or identity should not be dwelled upon too much. See, for example, the contrast between the Rebel Alliance with their open face helmet versus the faceless stormtroopers who were only ever identified by their armor in Star Wars. But armor isn't just used to enact a totalizing negation of the identity of the person who's inside it. It can also be an intensely personal expression, and indeed, historically, it often was. Historically, both European knights and indeed Japanese samurai went to great lengths to distinguish themselves and establish a stylistic expression for their own armor sets to make themselves recognizable on the battlefield. We do talk a lot about the difference between designing practical armor and purely ornamental armor that looks like it would be completely useless in combat, especially when it comes to video game character design. But the historical reality is that practicality is not the only concern when it comes to designing armor. Armor has cultural value as well, which is why you get things like muscle cuirass or helmets with faces engraved on them. Sometimes armor was meant to invoke divine protection from the gods or to express some part of your loyalty to your lord or proclaim your bravery or mold you into an image of a divine warrior. Now, if you click the card up in the corner right now, you'll be taken to a video called Towards an aesthetic understanding of arms and armor by a YouTube channel called That Works that goes into a lot of the detail related to all of this stuff. But why am I bringing it up in relation to the Dragon Rider? Well, look at his armor. 
Look at all the detail, all the finery, all the engravings and the symbols and the little visual markers that are embedded in how this guy looks. His weapons, his shield, and even the back of his breastplate is engraved with gold. And these things signify the power of the Lord that he has chosen to serve, but also the strength of his convictions and indeed the scale of his achievement. Not just everybody gets an armor that's as elaborate and well-crafted as this one. He earned that through accomplishment. And we know that through reading the item descriptions of his soul and his equipment, but it's also an evidence in the character design of the guy himself. And even though his chainmail is kind of tattered, and even though his armor is kind of burnished and maybe going a little bit brown over time, he still looks kind of magnificent, you know, when you can see him and the lighting isn't crap. But the point I'm trying to get to here is that there may be a lot more dudes in armor coming up in Dark Souls 2. But just because they're dudes in armor doesn't mean their character designs aren't interesting. And it doesn't mean that they don't tell some kind of a story. Dark Souls 2 is mimetically considered the unwanted middle child of the Dark Souls games. And so I guess if there's going to be a greater point to this particular playthrough of the game, it's to try and find a way to appreciate the game, not in spite of things that people tell me are flaws, but because of the choices that went into creating the game the way it is. Anyway, despite opening this segment by saying that I didn't have a lot to say about the Dragon Rider, I still ended up spending about eight minutes on him. Let's move on to the Pursuer. And here's where those eight minutes discussing the Dragon Rider are going to come in handy because... Look at this guy's armor. Now, there's a number of interesting things to discuss about the Pursuer's armor, but the first and most obvious is that, oh, those are faces. They're, those are screaming faces in pain. That's how he's chosen to decorate his armor. And the thing is, looking at the shape, the bulging unnaturalness of it all, it's not 100% clear whether those souls were intentionally carved there, or whether the armor was deformed by the pain and misery of actual souls that are trapped inside him. Now, if the Pursuer was just a dude in armor, then yeah, surely you could make the argument, oh, it's just an intimidation tactic, but he's not, though. The Pursuer is invested with all the visual indicators of a phantom, or a specter, or a ghost. He's got black fog swirling all around him. He's got spells that curse you. He rises up out of the ground to haunt you when you least expect it, and he floats. So the Pursuer isn't a dude in armor. The Pursuer is a nightmare. Now, I talked during the actual boss fight about how his character design seems to indicate that he only really cares about fighting and killing, that he carries these weapons on his back that are frankly clearly too small for him, and which he never uses, which indicates that they're more like trophies taken from slain foes than anything he carries around because it's especially useful to him. And we see this reflected in his item descriptions. His soul says that the pursuer seeks the bearer of the sign and will not rest until his target is slain. And his great shield and ultra great sword says the pursuer hunts down those branded by the curse as if each undead soul he claims will atone one of his sins. So, where the Dragon Rider did not lend himself well at all to my sort of personal journey, semi-psychological reading of Dark Souls 2 that I'm working with so far, the Pursuer works. Oh boy, does he work. So let's talk for a second about shadows. Now, in psychology, the shadow is a term that I believe was originated by Jung, and before we get into this, I should note I'm neither a psychologist nor a Jungian scholar. I'm using some of his thoughts as a jumping off point for a character design discussion, so please don't take my word as gospel on Jung. But the shadow in Jungian psychology represents a kind of negative version of you, not as a value judgment, but negative in the sense of being not necessarily your opposite, but an entity composed of all the negative aspects of your personality that you don't like to think of, all the things you don't like to believe about yourself, all those things that haunt you and torment you and which you try desperately to put out of your mind. The shadow tends to be made up of conflicting desires, animal instinct, unreal fantasies, and deep irrationality. It is, to put it in other terms, a dark reflection of yourself. Not an evil opposite version of you, but a version of you that contains all those qualities that you don't like to see within yourself. A great example of a shadow as a character type in a video game story is Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2. 
Pyramid Head is James Sunderland's shadow. Pyramid Head is all his aggression, all his self-hate, all his repressed sexual desire, all those unwanted, unhappy, destructive, haunting impulses that he has to come to terms with and overcome before he can leave the town of Silent Hill. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that the Pursuer is the Pyramid Head of Dark Souls 2, because presumably he's not going to be tied in quite so intimately with the narrative as Pyramid Head is with James Sunderland's, but since I have played a good deal further into the game than you're actually watching in this episode right now, I can tell you the Pursuer is going to be a recurring character in my playthrough. He always kind of seems to be there at the worst possible moment, haunting my steps like an unwelcome reminder of some sort. And so the question we have to ask is, if he's the player's shadow, all those dark, destructive, ugly impulses that haunt you as you go through your journey in Dark Souls 2, if he's a reflection, what exactly is he reflecting? Which is where we look back to his character design again, because doesn't that helmet look kind of familiar? Doesn't that look a lot like the Elite Knight helmet, i.e. the most iconic and famous helmet of Dark Souls, the one that's always used to represent a generic player character? And isn't there an interesting contrast between his helmet and his pauldrons and indeed the whole rest of his armor set, and then that bulging, unnatural, swollen chest plate? The chest plate is so swollen that his head actually looks kind of small in comparison to the rest of his body, almost as though he's been inflated. He's inflated with souls. We can see it both in his armor and in his item descriptions. The pursuer's existence is hunting down others, destroying them, and claiming their souls for himself, with a desperation that seems to suggest he's not just doing it like to level up, he's doing it because it's the only way to address a pressing emotional, spiritual, and psychological need, as the item description says, each undead soul he claims will atone one of his sins. And so the next question is, why are you in Drang Lake? Why are you hunting down others, destroying them, and claiming their souls for yourself? What makes the things that you do distinct from what the Pursuer does? We know the player character comes to Drang Lake in search of a cure for the curse, some kind of salvation. And as we arrive there, we are told that the only way to stave it off, the only way to hold back its encroach, the only way to prevent it from consuming us, is to gather up great souls, to gather great power to ourself, and then eventually go and meet King Vendrick. Somehow, that will lead to a salvation for the curse. But we're also told repeatedly that it's futile. There's no way we'll succeed, and even if we do succeed, it might be a lie. The Fire Keepers tell us so, the Crestfallen Knight tells us so. We will fail, and we will go hollow, and there's nothing we can really do to stop it. Which is why we're pursuing our quest so desperately, which is why we keep getting up every single time we die, which is why we keep going, because we don't have any other option. We have to do this, or the curse will claim us. We have to pursue this quest. In the last episode, I talked about how the last giant, this shattered, broken, discarded creature trapped in the depths of the earth, which flies into a berserker rage the moment it sees you, could be interpreted as kind of a warning sign, kind of this is who you'll be. This is what you are when you go hollow, a mad beast flailing with impotent rage at the world. Well, the pursuer can be seen as another version of that. A version where you're not broken and beaten and destroyed and hollow, but one where you are terrifyingly efficient. The pursuer is that horrifying ghost that you become from the perspective of literally everyone else in Drang Lake. No matter how many times they beat you down, you always rise again and you always come charging at them in the single-minded drive to claim their souls for yourself, as though each soul you absorb would absolve you of one of your past sins, absolve you of your curse. And that's another episode of The Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2. These are getting really, really long all of a sudden. I used to be able to do 30-minute episodes. I don't know what happened. 
Before we go, a last little note I wanted to bring up. Someone told me that in the Japanese version of the game, some text boxes indicate that the pursuer is actually a member of an order of undead hunters, and so that the characters that you encounter throughout the game are not the same character haunting you over and over again, but indeed a bunch of different pursuers, all members of the same group of pursuers who keep trying to find you and kill you. And if I was playing the Japanese version of the game and I read that text box, I would probably have a very different reading of the character, but I am basing my playthrough on the information that is actually in the version of the game that I am playing. And it might be that the English translation then is imperfect or that it leads to a different reading of the narrative that was not intended by the developers, but I don't care. Like, for the purposes of this particular playthrough, that doesn't especially matter. I'm reading the text as it's presented to me in the version that I have. And I bring this up because I got comments on the last series of the Boss Sons of Dark Souls as well, where people were kind of taking me to task for not considering a completely different version of the game and saying that some of my readings were invalid because they contradicted some pieces of information that were in the Japanese version of the game. And it's valid to a certain extent to kind of hew close to, oh, if it's a change in translation, then that's an imperfect non-canon change, but... I can't read Japanese and I can't go researching every single translation difference. That would make it impossible for me to evaluate the game. So I'm going by the English version and my readings should be considered in the context of the English version. Please. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this, please feel free to hit the subscribe button, the comment button, the like button, the bell icon, and all the other buttons that YouTube keep making you hit in order to be notified when I upload a video. I would certainly appreciate that support. And if you want to support the channel more directly, and especially the Boss Designs of Dark Souls, which is not a series that pulls in a ton of views for me, unfortunately, then Patreon is right there for that. You can sign up for a monthly subscription where you donate a dollar a month or something, and that is actually really helpful for me. If you don't want to do a monthly subscription, I completely get it. I have some tip jars down below where you can give me a one-time tip to say, hey, you've spent a whole lot of time talking about dudes in armor in this episode. Here, have three dollars and get yourself some water. And as I say at the end of my videos, for online content creators like me, even one or two dollars can be the same as thousands of views on a video or tens of thousands of views on a web page that are supported by advertising. Donating very small amounts to content creators feels like it doesn't really do much, but it actually makes much more of a difference than you think. So whether it's me or whether it's someone else, if there is an online content creator whose work you enjoy, please consider supporting them directly. It makes much more of a difference than you think. Anyway, there's probably a version of you that enjoyed this video and which has already clicked all the buttons that you're supposed to click and signed up to the Patreon. But there might also have been a version of you that didn't enjoy this video, a version of you with a lot of negative emotions about it. And if you're looking at the dislike button right now, hovering your mouse over it, considering clicking it, perhaps you should ask yourself, are you really you? Or are you merely the shadow? Thank you very much for watching.